and welcome to the Antikythera quiz. So called because you need a brain like the fiendishly complex Antikythera mechanism to win. The Antikythera mechanism was found in a shipwreck off the coast of a Greek island. It's a corroded mass of metal to look at, but scientists have probed its guts and found it's made of dozens of gear wheels all intermeshed with each other. Turn a handle on the side and it showed the sun, moon and planets all moving. It was the first computer and it's 2,000 years old. So you need an astronomy brain like this fiendishly clever mechanism to progress through the levels of this quiz. So tonight's prize is a £500 voucher for a top astro company and astronomers will compete through to the finals to win a £10,000 superstar prize. But first, they've got to knock out Nigel to make it through to the next round. So I am Vicky Dunkoff. I call myself the Astronomer Botherer Royal and um, I am the quiz master this evening. And this is Nigel Hembest, who is astronomer and an astronomer and future astronaut. Yes, indeed. I trained at, in radio astronomy at Cambridge, uh, but now I spend most of my time turning up books on space and the universe. I also have a ticket for Virgin Galactic. And I'm just waiting for the boarding call. I hope your bag is packed by the door waiting to go at all times, Nigel. Um, excellent. OK, so the two contestants we have tonight, we have Steve Tonkin. He writes Binocular Tour for Sky at Night magazine. He is a member of Fording Bridge Astronomers, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, and his specialist areas are binocular astronomy and outreach. He is also Dark Skies Advisor to the Cranbourne Chase AONB, uh, International Dark Skies Reserve. Competing with Steve, we have Owen Gwynn. He's a member of my own astron astronomical society, uh, Mid Cheshire. He always wins the Christmas quiz, which is why I thought he'd be so good at this. He's also a member of North Wales Astro Society. He's been keen on astronomy since he did a project on the planets in primary school. He's a visual observer and, in his own words, not mine, quite an unremarkable image. He doesn't have dark skies at home, so he travels to dark skies when he can. So say hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Right. OK. Uh, OK. This is War of the Worlds now. Um, so this is the first round. It's the holiday round. We could all do with a break. So we are going on holiday somewhere in the solar system. So pack your little knotted hanky and your pressurized swimming trunks. Steve, I've pegged all my washing out, but it's blown away. The wind was 2,100 kilometres per hour. Where am I? Mm, Neptune. Absolutely <laughs> right. Neptune has the highest steady wind speed of any planet. The other planets could be quite stormy as well. And that means that if you took off in a hot air balloon on Neptune and just let yourself be carried by the wind, you'd be travelling faster than Concord. I love that. Yeah. Uh, the, the furthest planet, it's, it, what's amazing about that is it's the furthest planet from the sun. So where does it get that energy to drive the tremendous winds from? And I love it that the centre of Neptune is hotter than the surface of the sun. Yeah. Well, all the planets are really hot inside. I mean, Jupiter Ooh. is even, even hotter. So uh, yeah. you, you want to go there for your holiday, Vicky. Owen, we are now going cross-country skiing. I am making my way across the Tombar Regio. Where am I? I would guess that you're on Mars. I'm afraid not. Owen. Ah. This is actually Pluto. Um, ah. The Tombar Regio was named after Clyde Tombar, who discovered Pluto in 1930, and it's a large plane of a large plane of frozen nitrogen um, discovered by the New Horizons mission when it went past in 2015. And in the pictures from New Horizons, it looked just like a giant white heart on the planet. Of course. It was that bit. Oh, I'm sorry, Owen. OK, on to the next round. Probes and craft. Steve, how many interstellar probes are heading out of the solar system right now? Let's see, there'd be a couple of pioneers and a couple of voyagers. And probably New Horizons is on its way out as well. So I reckon maybe five. You're absolutely right. And you've named them all precisely. Um, as of now, 
Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 have actually reached interstellar space, mm -hmm. and the other three are on interstellar trajectories, which will take them out of the solar system in due course. Oh, well done. Good work there, Steve. Okay, who, uh, sorry, which was the first NASA probe to be named after a living person, Steve? Me again? Yeah, you've got three. Oh, <laughs> the first NASA probe to be named after a living person? Oof. Um, I have no idea, so I'm going to have to give a wild guess. Um, let's see. Uh, was there, is there perhaps a shoemaker probe? It wasn't actually. I think this is a pretty oh. tough question and um, a, a good guess at it. It was actually the Parker Solar Probe which is of course, zooming yeah. right past the sun, really close to the sun at the moment. Uh, it was named after the physicist Eugene Newman Parker, who predicted the existence of the solar wind back in the 1950s. He was born in 1927. He was 91 when the solar probe was launched, and he's still going strong at 93. Oh, bad luck, <laughs> good, Steve. Good on him. Well, <laughs> 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 Nigel, there's a hope for a, 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 a Nigel probe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nigel. Okay, Astron was a, Steve, this is to you. Steve, um, Astron was a Soviet spacecraft launched on the 23rd of March, 1983. On board was an 80 centimeter ultraviolet telescope to observe Halley's Comet. The telescope was designed jointly by the USSR on which country? Oh. Again, please guess. What was it called again? Astron. Uh, um, Astron, yes. Uh, see, uh, France. <gasps> well done. Absolutely <laughs> spot on. <laughs> it, it was a French Soviet spacecraft. And um, as it was going around the sun, as well as measuring the huge coma of gas around the head of Halley's Comet, um, it made unique observations of the nearest supernova in the past 400 years because supernova 1987A exploded unexpectedly just the following year. So well done on that one. Good work, Steve. What a great guess. Okay, Owen, three probing questions for you. Which probe provided the first direct measurements of the density and temperature of the interstellar plasma? Oh, uh, that probably would have been Voyager 2. I'm afraid it was actually Voyager 1. Ah, it was going oh, ahead of Voyager 2. Oh, that was <laughs> desperately unlucky. <I> was. <laughs> well, it's probably a choice of two that you had there. It, it would have a choice of two, yes. <laughs> Voyager 1 left the sun's uh, extended region of gases, the heliosphere, and entered interstellar space in August 2012. And Voyager 2 followed in November 2018, so six years later. I'll have to make some, do some catching up. <laughs> You're going uh, out there as well, are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It won't, now, won't take long. <laughs> I remember seeing this fact on BBC, um, the, the first series of the planets that they did, and it really struck me in the heart, which is why I've chosen it for a question tonight. I felt so sorry for them. The Venera 14 craft had terribly bad luck at Venus. What happened? I have no idea, but I would uh, uh, no. I have I have no idea at all. I'm afraid. It is such an unlucky accident. I don't think you'd even guess. But it landed on the surface of Venus in 1982. It ejected the camera lens cap onto the ground, obviously, so you could take pictures of the surface, and the lens cap fell directly under the arm that was designed to measure the hardness of the planet's surface. Oh, right. They were actually retained information for the compressibility of the lens cap rather than the surface. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's sad. Right, okay, this should cheer you up. Owen, the day the Earth smiled was July the 19th, 2013. I remember it well. What happened? So that was when, uh, was it... Cassini took an image from Saturn of the Earth and everybody was to smile and wave at Saturn. Absolutely right. <laughs> Cassini was orbiting Saturn, turned to look at the Earth while uh, the sun was being eclipsed by, by Saturn and everyone had to wave for the camera. Absolutely perfect. 
Uh, now, I know, Nigel, you didn't get in the spirit of things you told me earlier, but did you, Owen and Steve, did you d turn for the world's biggest selfie organised by Carolyn Porco? Um, no, I was unaware of it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you just got the back of your head. <laughs> and I think Vicky was smiling for all of us then. Yeah, yes. the bald, yeah just got the bald patch. <laughs> Liz and I went out in the garden and we, we did our, our wave at the Saturn. <laughs> Yay! Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I remember seeing you on that picture, Owen. You look lovely. <laughs> okay, now we're going on to the famous quotes round, or infamous quotes, as some may be. Steve, um, you're going to get three quotes. Who said, I was trying to complete my research program and some silly lot of little green men had to choose my aerial to communicate with? Oh, I... Has it a great guess at Jocelyn Bell Burnell? <laughs> Absolutely, perfectly right. <laughs> she was what, what a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful woman she is. If you ever get a chance to hear her speak, do. She's highly inspirational. I absolutely agree. And um, I made that amazing discovery back in 1967 when she was just a research student. And yeah. um, her aerials picked up regular pulsing signals from space. And at first, the, the group there, uh, I was at Cambridge, but a few years after Jocelyn's discovery, the group there christened them the little green little green men signals, mm. were actually the signals from the first pulsars to be discovered. Yeah. Well done. Great guess there, Steve. Okay. Who wrote, this is a beautiful quote, all the disputes, all the disputes which have vexed philosophers through so many ages have been resolved. The Milky Way is in fact nothing but a mass of innumerable stars. Well, the first person to see the Milky Way as stars was Galileo, so I'm going to guess Galileo. It was indeed, yes. He wasn't, as I'm sure you're aware, the first person to actually um, invent the telescope or even to turn it to the sky. No. But he looked at the Milky Way and he actually published his results in 1609 uh, and realized that the Milky Way is made of stars and it wasn't just a big slash of uh, milk mm. across the sky or anything else like that. Yeah. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Okay. Um, final one for you, Steve, on quotes. If I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Now, this is an awkward one because you can take it in two ways. And one of the <laughs> ways you'd take it was that it was um, it was it was a slur against one of his great rivals, who was Robert Hooke. The, uh, yeah. the, but, the but the person who who said that was uh, Isaac Newton. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right, and I, I love that idea. He's getting at Robert Hooke um, because Robert uh, Hooke was a very small man. <laughs> so he's making the point, he stood on the shoulder of giants, not people like you, Hook. <laughs> the other story I like about when um, Newton published his work in the Principia Mathematica, um, the first two volumes, anybody can understand. Um, and then um, he realized that Hook wasn't quite as good a mathematician as he was. So he intentionally wrote the third volume in such a difficult mathematical way that Hook couldn't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those astronomers. And the, the rumor has it that he also, he, he dis, when the uh, Royal Society moved, he took Hook's portrait and threw it into a fire. So no portraits remain of Hook. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, well, I mean, a portrait was discovered recently, which is uh, a mathematician. And it is suspected that, in fact, that might be a portrait of Robert Hook because it includes diagrams of the uh, segments of the orbits that Hook was proposing oh. as an alternative or as a uh, maybe a whether it was backwards working from theory to uh, to justify his own claim that he in fact gave Newton the idea for uh, the centrifugal centripetal force mm. of gravity between the planet and the sun so there is a portrait that might be Hook Oh, God, I'm almost thinking that this quiz should have a, some extra points thrown in for copious knowledge of uh, a subject. That was a wonderful answer, Owen, and I had no idea about that. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, which, um, who categorically stated astrology... This is a question for Owen, is that right? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, it's Owen, yes. Who categorically stated astrology proves one thing and one thing only... There is one born every minute. 
<laughs> oh, it could be so many of us, couldn't it? <laughs> yeah, any um, astronomers. All astronomers. All astronomers. I would say it's a good bet that Brian Cox has said it at least once. <laughs> it sounds like a Brian Cox quote. <laughs> uh, well, I was going to say it's actually the person who has said it, I think it more than anybody else, um, was Sir Patrick Moore. It was one of, of his staple quotes. So, uh, and Patrick was never known for mincing his words. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Oh, Owen, I'll be so impressed with you if you get this one. Um, which astronomer royal declared, all this talk about space travel, it's utter bilge. That, uh, would that be Eddington, perhaps? No, it was a bit later than that. It was... Oh. Um, Sir Richard van der Reet Woolley in 1956, which was the really? year before Sputnik 1 was launched. But already both the Russians and the Americans were talking about launching satellites. And he went on to say, what good would it do us if we spent the same amount of money on preparing first-class astronomical equipment to learn much more about the universe? Which sort of might be true, but it's much more fun to, and much more exciting to land on the moon. It is. <laughs> uh, excellent, excellent. Okay, so now this is a particularly beautiful quote. Which 16th century astronomer caused a stir by stating, in the midst of all dwells the sun. For what better place could you find for the lamp in this exquisite temple where it can illuminate everything at the same time? Well, hopefully it's Copernicus because I need <laughs> the points. <laughs> uh, you're right, it was Nicholas Copernicus in his book, Gay Revolutionibus. <laughs> On his deathbed in 1543, when he said the Earth wasn't the centre of the universe, but the sun was instead. Well done. Excellent. Excellent. OK, so now we're going on to the moon's round. There are three moon questions for each of you astronomers. So, Steve, where would you find Puck, Umbriel and Oberon? Oh, they are three of the ones that are um, named after Shakespearean characters. <laughs> and uh, they are around Uranus. Um, um, sorry, um, Umbriel isn't. Umbriel's named after someone in the in the Rape of the Lock, I think, of Alexander Pope. But almost all of uh, Uranus's moons are named after Shakespearean characters. Absolute perfect answer. Yes, indeed. Well, the moons of the other planets are named after mythological characters. Yeah. Uh, Uranus is unique in having figures from literature, either from, as you say, uh, Shakespeare or from Alexander Pope. Yeah. Yes. For, um, Jupiter's moons are all named after lovers of Zeus, <laughs> <laughs> including Ganymede, who was a boy. Yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, and, and Jupiter has about seventy moons. So, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the the named ones. The named ones. <laughs> yeah, Zeus was a lucky guy. So, okay, um, okay, Steve, to you. Who was the fourth man to walk on the moon? Oh. So there was Armstrong and Aldrin. Aldrin wanted to be first and didn't get there. And the next one, who was it? Was it? It was the it was Apollo Twelve. That's one that rumor has they took a bottle of um, of harpoon um, rum in, in to spin up with them. Um, oh, what was that? Michael Collins? No, I. It, that's sheer guess. I'll, I'll, I'll know it when I hear it. I, because I, I, I sort of know the story. They, the other th thing I remember, and I can't remember who they were. They had these things on their wrists where they had to go, um, where, where, to show them what you know the order of things they had to do. And the other team, because you had a navy team and an air force, army team, I think. And the other team had, had prepared these things. And on one of them, the real things were interspersed with copies of Playboy pictures <laughs> and with comments like, you know, you must you must walk between the two big mounds and stuff like that on it. I <laughs> uh, can't remember. Yeah, that was fun. No, I'll, it, it wasn't Michael Collins, but I can't yeah. think who it was. Yeah, was. Yeah, I mean, Michael Collins was the um, command module pilot oh, on, on, a, on, a, on Apollo 11. 11 yeah. so, um, Apollo 12 was Pete Conrad and Alan Con Dean, who were the landers on the moon. So for the fourth man, uh, Vicky's tricky question there was actually Al Bean. Yeah. Um, landed on, a, on a board Apollo 12 on the moon um, in November 1969 when he was 37 years old. Um, after he came back to Earth, and left NASA, he became a space artist. And um, he 
did some amazing pictures of the surface of the moon because he's one of the few artists, the only artist ever, I guess, to have been to the moon and knows what it really looks like. And he actually signed his pictures by taking his moon boot which had particles of moon dust and impressing it into picture. So every picture you'd buy from Albine would have a bit of moon, genuine moon dust. Wow. Yeah. That's Isn't that fantastic? That's, that's a good selling point. Yes, very good. Okay, <laughs> Steve. Could do that, Vicky. <laughs> Steve, where would you see, when would you see a worm moon? That's my worm impression. A worm moon? Presumably, that's one of the names of uh, the American names of uh, a full moon. Um, so let's say a full moon of February. Close, but not close enough, I'm afraid, Steve. It's actually the, the March full moon. Um, oh. <laughs> but um, I, don't, I don't know why the worms come out in March. So maybe Vicky no. can, can, can tell us that. But the other names for that same moon, the March full moon, are the wind moon the crow moon, and oddly enough, the saw eye moon. When it comes to looking at your telescope. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so Owen, three moon questions for you. Tethys belongs to which planet? Tethys belongs to Saturn because it's my daughter's favourite moon. And she, she, so it's nice to have a, a daughter that's given me an answer, even though it's 30 years <laughs> since she's loved Saturn. <laughs> Oh, good, good, good for her. That, that's really great. Yes, it's, it's named after um, the, the Titan, a giant from Greek mythology, obviously called Tethys as well, and discovered by Giovanni Domenico Cassini in 1684. Uh, and why was it her favourite moon, Owen? It's quite an obscure one. I don't know. Um, she liked Saturn. She always liked looking at Saturn through the telescope, and she just I think she just liked the idea of Tethys because it's got some nice letters in it. The <laughs> T-H-Y-S is a, it's a nice combination of letters. It's a pleasing name, actually. It's a very pleasing name. Okay, second moon question for you, Owen. Valis Schrodinger can be found where? Schrodinger, I think, is that on Mercury? I'm afraid not. It was actually closer to us than that. It is actually one of the valleys, uh, one of the long linear valleys on the moon. Um, uh, a trick question because it's on the far side of the moon, so it's not one that you would have seen right. for yourself. Uh, and it's oriented radially to a huge basin called Schrodinger. And the original Owen Schrodinger that these features are named after was a famous physicist um, whose main um, interest these days was that he had um, a cat that was uh, alive and dead at the same time. But uh, that's a different program. Yes. Now, speaking of um, cats, we do have a special bonus round that is triggered if a cat happens to walk on screen. Now, Nigel so far is the only one of us who's got a cat present, but she's not making an appearance. So yeah, no I'm, 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 I'm afraid, Vicky, the show is not exciting her enough. Uh, <laughs> she's in the corner little, of the room. <laughs> give her a, have you, shake the little carton of treats for her and get her to jump up. Um, okay, so then, Buzz Aldrin, Owen, did something on the moon that could not be broadcast for legal reasons. Uh, what was it? Uh, I um, ooh, it could be so many things, but I'm <laughs> afraid I, I'll have to pass on this one. I'm afraid it's possibly not one of the ones you were thinking of. He, <laughs> he took communion on the moon, right? He he took some communion wine with him and a miniature chalice in his personal possessions, which the astronauts were allowed to take with them. Um, but a lawsuit against NASA uh, meant they couldn't broadcast religious activities um, on a NASA mission. So as a scientist, what I find interesting is the first experiment on the flow of liquid on another world um, was actually an observation of communion wine. All right. <laughs> I think that's lovely. And that's one of my new astronomical, my, my favorite new astronomical facts. I need to find more about the vintage of the wine, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Californian. Okay. So, Nigel, points update. Oh, I can't imagine who is in the lead here. I have no clue. So, well, we're, I mean, halfway, we're halfway through the quiz now. Uh, Owen has garnered three points, and Steve has eight points under his belt. Ooh, okay, right. Ooh. Congratulations. Uh, right. Well, you still have half a oh, it's, it's, not, it's not over yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> there is still loads of time left uh, for you to catch up, Owen. Um, okay, so 
Now, we know that a spelling B is where you have to spell out a word, but because this is astronomy related, we're calling a, a spelling B hive cluster. <laughs> we had to leave it in somehow. So it's sudden death. The instant you make a mistake with one of these astronomical words, it's on to the next. So, Steve, you're going to get a three. Uh, everybody's favourite astronomical word, syzygy. S Y Z Y G Y. <laughs> good good, good hangman word, that no vowels. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Unless you're playing against an astronomer, when it's actually probably a good bet that if it's a six letter word, it could all be syzygy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, it's as well as looking nice and sounding nice, it's an alignment of three celestial objects the sun, the earth, and then either the moon or a planet. Just like the Y is the letter Y in that word. <laughs> yes, we're, we're probably three in a line. <laughs> Yes, with Scrabble, I don't think you have enough Ys to do that. <laughs> okay, so the next one is uh, a moon crater called Humboldt. Humboldt. That must be named after that great um, German explorer, um, von Humboldt. So it would be H-U-M-B-O-L-D-T. Absolutely correct, yes. And you have his name right to Alexander von Humboldt, who was an That's explorer, right. a scientist, and a general polymath. Ah. Very good. So, well yeah, done. He, yeah, he, he, he did some amazing stuff in South America. Um, and he was really one, one of the first, I suppose you'd call it, ecologists. And he was, he was, you know, really sort of mapping the where the vegetation was per altitude and stuff like that. It was... I really, yeah, he, he really brought back some ideas that nobody ever thought of before when he came. And it is, as well as having a crater on the moon, the, the cold current that flows off the west coast of South America is the Humboldt yep. current. That's right. Res responsible for the Atacama Desert. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and hence for a lot of good um, telescopes that are sighted in the driest yep. place on Earth. Oh, yeah. And I'm a, a huge fan of the Humboldt penguins, which I can um, confirm will peck you if you torment them with a feather. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the third and final spelling beehive cluster for you, Steve. Comet Borrelly. Oh. Yeah. I'm trying to get the number of R's and L's correct. <laughs> um, I'll probably get it wrong. B O double R E L. Oh, it's an I E Y. Y. I think almost there, but it's a double L before the Y. B O double R double L Y. Sorry about that. Oh um, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's other came to fame that after. Halley's Comet was visited by Giotto. Comet Borelli was the second to be spied up close up by a spacecraft when NASA's Deep Space One got there in 2001 and took pictures of its dark black nucleus. Oh, very good. Okay, congratulations. Owen, I'm sorry, these are really tough words. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how we get on anyway. Libra's Alpha Star Zubinel Ganubi. Well, I would say it starts with a Z. Congratulations. Uh, Z E U. No, I'm afraid it's just uh, Z U at the beginning. Straight so, into uh, Z U. Try to be too clever. Uh, before fine. we get on to the rest of it, Z -E B E N E L G E N U B I. Um, and it means, in fact, um, from Arabic, the southern claw, because originally mm. Libra was this, the claws of um, Scorpius, the scorpion. So, right. Z -E -L -G -E was the southern claw. Sorry, you'll remember that from now on. Owen, I'm sorry, this is another absolute stinker. <laughs> Cherimov Gerasimenko. <laughs> I'm not, are you not giving him both words? So that, that surely that's got to be two questions, Vicky, be fair. Okay. So you'll go just for one of them Charumov or Kerimovenko. So, okay, G E R. Uh, I am uh, afraid it's an A G E L S I M E N K O. For it was on a hiding to nothing anyway. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but what I'm sure okay. you do know, 
is that it was the target of um, Rosetta, the European spacecraft, mm -hmm. and its lander Philae in 2014. Um, Which is why so, everyone calls it 67P, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I think Vicky was very brave to go for the pronunciation. I did now. it. Um, oh, oh, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, there's definitely no favoritism in this quiz at all. Um, right, she not. is the Chinese goddess of the moon, and her name is Wang Shu. Can you spell that? Uh, w A mm -hmm. N J I. I'm afraid the usual spelling is W A N G S H U Wang Shu. Um, usual tr transliteration of it. Um, and as well as being Chinese goddess of the moon, it's the name of the first exoplanet that was discovered by Chinese astronomers. It lies 440 light years away in the constellation Lara, if you should ever want to go out and take a look for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were fiendish. Maybe next time we do this, I'll make them slightly easier. Okay. Now then, oh gosh, these are tough rounds. I'm so sorry to do this to you, astronomers. You must be sweating. Uh, this next round is called the Arc Minute Round. Uh, you have to talk for one minute without saying um or hesitating for longer than a second on a subject. So, first of all, Nigel, what's an arc minute? An arc minute is a measure in the sky. Uh, so you've got a degree of sky, um, and then an arc minute is one sixtieth of a degree. And just to give you an idea of what that's like, the moon is about 30 arc minutes across, as is the sun, which is... Uh, the same size, that's why we get total eclipses of the sun. And an arc minute is about the same size in the sky as the, the largest planets um, by appearance. So Jupiter and, and Venus are, are typically around about an arc minute in size. So that's what we're aiming for. Excellent. Okay, so... A minute. Ooh, a minute. <laughs> this, is, this is like just a minute. So... <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the topics are much harder on this one because they're yeah. scientific. You say I can't say er, can I say um? <laughs> no <laughs> not at all uh any form of hesitation and um the ejector seat kicks in so you have been warned okay steve talk for one minute about the poles of mars the poles of mars are covered in dry ice which is solid carbon dioxide mixed with water ice which of course is solid ice hydrogen and oxygen mixed. So in other words, in the poles of Mars, on those ice caps, you have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, which in any other circumstance could make carbohydrates. Now, when Mars gets closer to the sun, as it is at the moment, you notice that the poles, the polar ice caps get smaller and smaller. And it's not because this stuff melts, because the carbon dioxide is there, it sublimes, which means it goes from the solid directly to the gas. Now, you can notice this on Earth as well. If you put carbon dioxide, solid carbon dioxide, dry ice onto a stage or something like that, it creates the smoke. It doesn't melt at all. The other thing that this ice can do, because it's well done, under Steve. the surface. <laughs> <Whoa! laughs> <Wow! laughs> Without hesitation at all. Well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell, yeah, that was actually, difficult. Actually, Excuse my language. Yeah, so we appreciate that too. <laughs> oh my gosh, I remember uh, on Radio 4, just a minute, Pam Ayres did her debut and she did for the first time her, out of the, straight out of the traps a minute on her debut. So uh, well done, Steve. That was very impressive. Owen, are you all right, Steve? <laughs> okay, <laughs> Owen, are you ready for this? I'm ready and waiting. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Oh, gosh, my heart is pounding. Okay. Owen, for one minute, please talk about... Well, we're going to... We'll move it. You can't pause for longer than three seconds. How about that? Okay. Owen, talk for one minute about the solar wind. Off you go. The solar wind is a mass of electrons and protons and helium nuclei that is given off from the surface of the sun due to the effects of magnetic wrapping around magnetic field lines wrapping around on the surface of the sun and as these wrap they can cause themselves to twist and produce eruptions of solar matter ionized matter from the surface of the sun and it stretches out 
into the solar system, both as a steady stream, but where we get big explosions, you get a coronal mass ejection that produces large amounts of material produced at coming out at the same time, and it can interfere with the Earth's magnetic field to produce aurora at the poles. And if the field strength is particularly strong because of magnetic influence on the sun, the solar One wind... One is up. Congratulations. <laughs> <Way>! Hey, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing <laughs> right oh and i reckon we ought to see if we can get on ourselves onto that to radio 4 program <laughs> i think we could i think we, i think there was quite a lot of repetition of words that weren't in the title i have to admit for both of us there, <laughs> 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 there we, that that is true yes <laughs> But I'm Vicky never said anything about repetition so he, neither if you hesitated yeah. and we're, that was marvelous that was incredible. Yeah, that was that was absolutely incredible. OK, so now we are going to go on over to the images round. And astronomy, of course, is a visual subject, so we can't have a quiz without some pictures in it. And we're going to have three different kinds of pictures, one for each of you. I guess the galaxy surface tension is going to be looking at the surface of a body, a moon or a planet, perhaps, and then uh, probe your lobes. <laughs> back <to our> <laughs> so we're going to start with guess the galaxy. It took me 20 minutes with a, th th a thesaurus yesterday to come up with probe your lobes <laughs> and a rhyming dictionary. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so Steve, the first three are to you. Guess the galaxy. Where is or what is this beauty? Ooh. Right, a lot of star forming. It's, um, I wonder if it's Messier 33. The Triangulum Galaxy. Correct. Oh, Messier, the other one's known as the Triangulum Galaxy because it's in the constellation of, of Triangulum. Um, it's the second nearest spiral galaxy to us after Andromeda, a little bit further mm. off at 2.7 million light years. And it's just, they say it's just visible to the naked eye on a really dark night. Now, where I live, I don't really have a, a really dark night. Have you, have you seen it, Steve? I've, s I've seen it once in, in England. Um, it's it's easier when you've got much darker, clearer skies. It was a November about four years ago, just after rain had clean, really cleaned the atmosphere. It was a beautiful, transparent night. It was about 11 o'clock at night. It was nice and high. And with averted vision, I could just see it. Um, I had to check. So I thought I might have been seeing um, a cluster nearby, NGC 752, which is easier to see. But no, it was it was definitely that. It was uh, it's it's. Yeah, knockout. I, I, <laughs> my eyes didn't... aging. I'm surprised. <laughs> it didn't look quite like this amazing photograph, though. Uh, no, it looked nothing like that at all. It was a tiny, tiny, tiny little fuzzy smudge. Okay, well, well done on both counts, there, Steve. Impressive knowledge, and even happier that you've seen it. Okay, on to surface tension. Where is this the surface of? Oh, that's one of those moons of Saturn, isn't it? What the heck? It's not, um, it's not Mima. Mimas is the one that was, uh, any idea? Probably isn't. Is it Enceladus? It's it absolutely oh, is. Yeah, well done. <laughs> it's, it's one of the, the icy moons, one of the moons that's totally made of ice on the surface, um, along with Europa, which goes around um, Jupiter. Mm. And this groovy terrain you can see is because the icy surface on Enceladus moves around over a global ocean, liquid water mm. underneath there. And you place it, it cracks open, and water sprays out into space and freezes to create a ring around Saturn as uh, following the orbit of Enceladus, which is the E-ring. Who knows oh. what delights lurk under that beautiful crisp white shell. Well, there mm. are hydrocarbons coming out in it. That I do yeah. know. There are yeah. absolutely, yeah, uh, organic molecules of various kinds. So it's a mm. prime place to look for life, swimming around in those oceans under the ice. Okay, and the next one, and final image question for Steve. Just the probe the lobe. <laughs> probe the lobe. Probe oh, the lobe. Yeah. This won't hurt at all, but which is mm -hmm. this probe? Oh, is that Curiosity? Oh. It's not, I'm afraid. It's, it's, a, it's an oh. earlier one. This is Spirit. Um, ah. It had an identical twin called Opportunity, so you could have said yes. either of those. Um, 
<laughs> no, actually, it's interesting because it's got the big solar panels on top. Both Spirit and Opportunity have solar panels for power. With Curiosity has a nuclear power plant. Um, ah, of course, yes. Yeah, Spirit landed on in 2004. It was designed to last for three months, but it actually carried on for six years. And not only that, but Opportunity, its twin, trundled on for 14 years after it landed on Mars. So um, <laughs> that's a long, a long life achievement. Okay. Oh, Owen, it's over to you. Guess the galaxy for Owen. Ooh, so that's... See, I got M33. Um, <laughs> is this you the Black Eye, gal Black yeah. Eye Galaxy? But I can't yep. remember the name uh, we, we don't need to have the catalogue now. Oh, it's, it's actually Messier 64, um, but the black eye will do as well. This one is 17 million light years away from us. And um, the black eye you can see here was probably caused when the big spiral galaxy in the picture was punched by a smaller galaxy. Doosh. Doosh. Yes, it needs um, an intergalactic... Is it steak you meant to put on a black eye? That's an old <laughs> remedy. A vegetarian plate, please, Ricky, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, so um, surface tension. Owen, where is this place? That place, I can't see any footprints. I would say that is Mercury. It was my answer before. Is it Mercury? It is absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly tricky question because it looks um, a lot like the moon. It's highly cratered and it doesn't have any atmosphere, as you can see from yes. the black sky around the edge. Uh, but there's one giveaway which may be visible in this picture if you take a close look. Uh, Mercury craters don't have such extensive deposits of blasted out rocks because it has stronger gravity than the moon. All right. Mm. Mm. And finally, Hold still, Owen, because we're going to probe your lobes. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this un unusual looking craft? Ah, that's. Is that one of the pioneers? I'm afraid it's not. I won't say it's a trick question, but it's a slightly non obvious one. This is actually Juno. Uh, which went into orbit around Jupiter in 2016. Now, the previous craft that went to Jupiter used nuclear power. Juno was the first to use solar panels, um, which is totally amazing because the sunlight at Jupiter is only 4% as intense as it is at the Earth. So you're not going to get much of a tan on Jupiter then. <laughs> Well done. And that was the conclusion of the uh, images round. Okay, next then, I don't know what your mu knowledge of pop music is like. Steve, we did meet at a science and uh, music festival, so I'm assuming you're going to know some lyrics. <laughs> 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 don't worry, as we're not going to... master to the universe. Or <laughs> <laughs> okay, space songs now. And I'm going to present these in a way very dissimilar to how they were sung originally to throw you off the trail even further. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, some may say, I'm wishing my days away. No way. And if it's the price I pay, some say, tomorrow's another day. You stay. I may as well play. <laughs> Oh, I can hear the song. Um, I haven't a clue what it's called. I haven't a clue who sung it. Sorry. It's called, it's called Walking on the Moon. And maybe you can hear the tune now, Walking on the Moon by Police in 1979. Police, yeah. yep. That's right. Uh, but there's an interesting story behind this because um, apparently the tune came to, to Sting from the police when he was drunk in a hotel room after a concert and <laughs> as he staggered around the room. This tune came into his mind with the lyrics, Walking Round the Room. <laughs> I think maybe walking, walking on the moon is, 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 is a bit more romantic than that <laughs> Okay, so then, Owen, over to you, the lyric round Sounds of laughter, shades of life are ringing through my open ears Inciting and inviting me, limitless, undying love Which shines around me like a million suns No, I'm I'm not big on lyrics anyway, so and and your oh. rendition, though flawless, didn't mm -hmm. help. <laughs> <laughs> In a song called Across the Universe, that's the astronomical connection um, by the Beatles on their Let It Be album in 1970. And again, there's a nice story that um, John Lennon admitted about writing this song. 
Um, you know, it sounds so cosmic, but apparently his then wife Cynthia was, as he said, going on and on about something. <laughs> and, and the song starts, words are flowing out like endless rain into a paper cup. They slither while they pass, they slip away across the universe. <laughs> Again, a bit, a bit prosaic there. No. But a, a beautiful song that came out of it. Yeah, the beautiful song that's always moved me to tears is just about a bit of that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, you'd never guess what. That was the final round. <laughs> well, except for the Very fiendish knockout, knockout Nigel round, which is just going to make everything 10 times worse. So, um, Nigel, please reveal the final score. Well, after some very tricky questions, um, Owen has got six points, but I'm afraid he's eclipsed by Steve with 12. Oh, well done. Well done, Steve. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, so, I think I might have had some easier questions there, actually. <laughs> you <rounds>. think? <laughs> well, I'd put it, put it this way. I knew more of the answers to mine than I did to Owen's. <laughs> That's how quizzes work. <laughs> oh well, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah they're e they're easy if you know the answers. Yeah. Um, okay. The pressure's off. It's easier as well. Owen, I'm sorry to put you under so much tension, but you now have got the chance to. Um, well, the way this final round works, um, basically, Steve, congratulations, you have won the five hundred pounds prize bundle. <sighs> Owen, you have won the constellation prize. So, what's the constellation prize there, Nigel? It's a copy of the book which Heather and I wrote and has just been published, 2021 Stargazing, everything up in the sky to take a look at for the whole of next year, month by month guide. Uh, and I'm very happy to sign it for you. Oh, Thank there you, you go. It's got to be worth that. more than £500. <laughs> 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 okay, so here, astronomers, is the twist. Owen, you still have got a chance to take out Steve and stop him going through to the next round. So, Steve, your £500 bundle is safe, but there's a £10,000 superstar prize within your red dot finder. In the knockout Nigel round, you get to ask Nigel and Steve three questions each. Nigel first, um, Steve second. If Steve wins or draws with Nigel, he goes on to the next round. And as I say, that £10,000 superstar prize is within his sight. If Steve loses, you'll still get a £500 prize bundle. But as I say, won't progress into the next round. So, Steve, can you knock out Nigel and make him see stars? <laughs> Owen, you are now the quiz master. It is over to you. First question for Nigel, please. First question for Nigel is... Which constellation contains the most Messier objects? Um, my <laughs> guess there would be the constellation of Virgo because it contains the Virgo cluster of galaxies and there are quite a few Messier objects in that. No, I'm afraid the answer is Sagittarius. Oh, really? Lots of nebula. Of course, yeah. Yes. Oh, all lots those of clusters. Yeah. clusters. <laughs> Ooh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, am I asking Steve three, uh, Nigel, three questions? Yes. yes. First of all, right. Okay. Um, Nigel, what letter links the lunar craters of Blanchinius, Lacai, <laughs> and Purbach, and no other? So, what, what letter, letter links those? What letter links those? Um, well, presumably not in the actual names of the craters, because that might be a bit easy. Um, there are smaller craters, the round craters on the moon, um, which are named A, B, and C after the, the main crater. Um, so maybe they're the only ones that have small craters that um, go down to maybe D, the surrounding craters? No, they are the three or three craters that make up the boundaries of the lunar X. Oh, oh. 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 Nice question. I don't feel so bad now, Owen, about asking <laughs> you these hard questions. They're really hard. And third and final question. So who was the first scientist to prove that stars had proper motion? Uh, that was uh, Edmund Halley or Hawley. Correct. Um, second Apollo Royal, better known for his comet, but he did measure proper motions of the stars. 
Indeed. So that's one one point for me. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. So Steve. There are forty eight stars brighter than the second magnitude. Five of them are in Orion. Which constellation has the next has four of them? Ooh. Ursa Major? No, it's actually Callis Major. Ooh. Oh, cool. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> next question. And this isn't a trick question, but listen carefully. Uh, yeah. So if answer is the answer, what is the astronomical question? Vulpecula. Well done. <laughs> Beautiful. Which it, it, it used to be known as Vulpecula et Ansa, the, the fox and right. goose. So it's the brightest star in, in Vulpecula is Ansa. Mm. Yeah. And then yeah. final question, and the decider quite possibly, is which is the only constellation named after a specific place on Earth? Uh, that will be Mensar, Table Mountain. And I specially saved that one for you because of <laughs> your origin. <laughs> there was no Table Mountain in Rhodesia. <laughs> well, congratulations, Steve. Um, oh, thank you, Nigel. Now. You've done the knockout, Nigel, um, by two to one. So that means that you are moving on to the next round. <sighs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Vicky, I can't hear you. Sorry, gentlemen, that was uh, an incredibly tough quiz. Thank you so much for participating. How do you feel? How was that for you, boys? Tough. I wonder if oh, it was just right, a... <laughs> the, 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 the last minute or two was the toughest, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I was, um, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I enjoyed it. I I I love I love quizzing, but that, this that was um, it was not the easiest quiz I've been in, shall we say? And Owen, how did you feel? Uh, it's definitely not the easiest quiz I've been in. Uh, I think I'm better at setting questions than answering them quite often. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's payback time. Oh, payback. In, in that in that context, yes, you were. You <laughs> <came>. <laughs> So I think really when I devised this quiz, the idea of the Antikythera mechanism went through my head and I thought this really has to be a hard quiz with just nothing easy in it at all. So thank you so much for competing, gentlemen. Steve, you are through to the next round. And don't forget, you both get that lovely constellation prize of Heather and Nigel's book. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Astronomers usually say clear skies, but I think we can do better than that. So may your lenses stay unfogged and your necks never crick. Good night from the Good night, everybody. I'm Good Stephen night. Owen. Okay, Good bye. Night. Thank you all. Bye. Night night.